Sandy West. Hi, I'm Sandy West, and I'm here on Jerry's rooftop, straddling the roof, actually, with my feet. <laughs> um, behind us is a gorgeous, uh, somewhat sunset coming up. Yes. And uh, behind me is the mountains, which you'll see in a minute. A minute. <laughs> we have we'll to edit. edit. Uh, and lots of trees, and of course, that brisk winter air, which I absolutely love. <laughs> And somebody's speeding around the corner. Okay, we are talking with Sandy West here. Hi, hello, Sandy. Oh, hello, Jerry. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. Um, when did I start playing drums? Yeah. Well, let me back up a bit. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I started playing violin at eight years old because I was trying to follow my sister's footsteps, and uh, I didn't like the instrument. I was frustrated and threw it down. I knew there was something else out there for me. Well, <laughs> my grandfather had an old uh, six and a half inch Ludwig uh, stainless steel drum, snare drum, in his garage. And I found it and took it out and started beating on it. <laughs> Gave me an idea, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, at nine years old, I enrolled in the elementary, Long Beach Unified School District elementary um, music class. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I was officially the first girl allowed to actually play, to learn how to play the drums in elementary school in the Long Beach Unified School District. And I stuck with it through elementary school and ju through junior high. And of course in school you have to like, um, there's a first chair, second chair, and third chair in, in their lineup. And so I would challenge the guys and, and you know, get that first chair position. Then in high school, I was um, I was playing also um, in the marching band, orchestra, and stage band. But going back to junior high, I started playing live on stage at 13, playing parties and dances and different events in the, in the city I was from, Huntington Beach. So that's how and when I started playing drums. Okay. Okay. Um, how did I meet Kim Fowley? Well, I lied to my parents. Um, a couple friends of mine invited me to go up to the Starwood, which is a club in Hollywood. And as I said, I'm from Huntington Beach, California. And um, what we did is we told our parents that we were going to Disneyland for the night. So I got all dressed up, and we went to the Starwood to see a band. Then afterwards, the thing to do was to go to the Rainbow Bar and Grill because that's where all the stars and producers and all these people hang, hang, would hang out after it would close down. So I was standing there in the parking lot of the Rainbow and my friend said, there's Kim Fowley, you know, he's you know, written for Kiss and Alice Cooper and he's produced this and produced that. You know, he's a big shot, so. I went right up to him on my own. <laughs> I said, hi, you know, I play drums and you know, I'm in a band right now. He goes, how old are you? Well, I'm 15 and a half. He says, you're kidding me. He goes, I'm working with a girl right now who's 14, and she's a lyricist. I think she knows a friend out in the valley who plays electric guitar, who is about 16. So I said, well, I may be interested. And uh, he said, give me your phone number, and I'll give you a call in a couple days. I'll give you the phone number of this girl that I think that you might want to hook up with. So he did. It was around dinner time when he called. My mom answered the phone. And uh, she's got you know, this older man's on the phone. Well, I kind of had to make up something real quick, but I did get the information from him, took the number down, and called this girl in the valley. It turned out to be Joan. She uh, arrived a couple weeks later with her little Sears guitar in hand. She took three buses and four hours later from Canoga Park to Huntington Beach. It's about a 45 mile radius, I mean, drive. And uh, in in my house upstairs, we had this big room. We had a pool table and my drum set. And, and I had one of the guys left over his Marshall Stack amplifier and a Les Paul guitar. And she walked in, she's like, oh my God, all this equipment. So she picked it up and started playing Susie Quattro songs, which I was a little familiar with. I was playing Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. But she had such great rhythm that you know, we just, we uh, hit it off so well together. We called up Kim over the phone put the receiver down, and uh, said, Kim, take a listen to this. I think money signs went off in his eyes. 
because uh, they said that it sounded great and that there's the two of us out there, there must be more girls. From then on, we started um, putting uh, advertisements in the paper for auditions and searching nationwide and even in England. We flew people in from Cleveland and New York to audition. We came up with a bass player uh, a few months later called Mickey Steele. And uh, so we were the three piece. And we played the whiskey and the Starwood and you know, got a lot of, got a, got a lot of recognition. And um, then we started advertising for more people. After that, we found uh, Lita Ford and Cherie Curry and Jackie Fox, which completed the five piece of the Runaways. The next major event that happened was we were signed to Mercury, and um, we went in the studio and made our first album, which was at, uh, oh my gosh, hold on, it's on the tip of my tongue. This could be footage, huh? Uh, Fidelity, thank you, in the valley. <laughs> Party rip, that's right. Okay, so we recorded our first album, and um, after it was released, we went on tour. And part of our tour in the United States was done with a group called Spirit from Randy, California. Like a 60s group. That was on Mercury also. So we did some pretty big shows with them, opening for them. And was advertised pretty good. Did a lot of promo and handprints in the uh, cement. The sun's going away. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and um, record store appearances and stuff. And then we did some shows on our own. And we did really good at that. After that, we went to Europe. When did you notice things like starting to get, to get crazy a little bit? I would say not the first tour. I mean, the, the pace was picking up as far as the scheduling and stuff. But I think the excitement and the, when people could actually start to digest the whole situation was probably after the first tour, into the second album, into the second tour. It was a lot more intense, and the crowds were crazier and rowdier. And, it was fun, but it was a lot more to handle. And each, I think each year got more intense as far as response and uh, the volume of crowds that we were, we were uh, drawing. Right. Yeah. But that's, I think it's a good way to, to end this part of the segment because it's like two girls that were teenagers got together, perfect, perfect strangers, and um, formed a group of this maniac man. <laughs> <laughs> he was crazy. <laughs> and uh, it started taking off. And, and it's think, still taking off. Yeah, it's, and it's still happening. <laughs> so I guess the next thing we'll talk about is what happened maybe during the, the first tour and 